anyone causes one of these little ones who trust in me to lose faith, it would be better for that person to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tried, tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better to enter heaven with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better to enter heaven with only one foot than to be thrown into hell with two feet. where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It is better to enter the kingdom of God half blind than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out. For everyone will be purified with fire. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? You must have the qualities of salt among yourselves and live in peace with each other. For me? <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Malia. <laughs> All right, so um, this morning, the, the text that, that Malia just read to us is the second half of a sermon that we started last week. So in order to make sense of this week, we have to go back and look at what we read last week. Um, the, the context of this is that Jesus has just revealed to his disciples for the second time that the reason that he came was to die and then three days later, to rise again. And how did the disciples respond to this great revelation? They immediately began to argue as to which one of them was the greatest. Not a good look for the disciples. And so Jesus is like, all right, we need to correct this teaching moment. And he goes into this, this little mini sermon for his disciples to respond to their their, their wrong attitudes. And so he begins in verse 35. He says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Jesus, this is the, the, the thesis statement for this entire sermon, that everything else that we're going to read after this must be read through the lens of verse 35 that we covered last week. Jesus says his kingdom is upside down from any other kingdom or any other rule that you've ever seen. That his kingdom, the, the one who is the greatest, must climb down to the bottom rung of the ladder and must put everyone else's needs before their own and become a servant. To be great in God's kingdom, you must learn to humble yourself first and to love sacrificially. Those are the qualities that Jesus values above, above everything else in the kingdom of heaven. Um, and then he goes on to give a couple different illustrations as to what this looks like. The first of which, he takes a child and scoops them up in his arm. And he says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Uh, now, I, I did have someone come up to me after the service and said, Pastor, it was a good sermon I agree with about 70 to 80 percent of that. And I'm like, how do you agree with you need to humble yourself and serve others? And then they say, you said that children have no value. And I think children bring a lot of value. And I'm like, yes, you are absolutely right. But the value that children bring to our lives are more of an eternal significance. They are a great source of joy. If, you're, if all you're focused about in this life is power, and wealth and influence, children aren't going to help you very much in that. Uh, and so what he's saying is that you must learn to love like you do, like a parent loves a small child, where you're saying, I am going to give everything that I have for this child, knowing that I'm getting nothing in return. That's the kind of sacrificial love that Jesus demonstrated to us and that he demands from us. Um, and so 
when we continue on in verse 42, we're going to see he's going to reference that child again. And uh, what we see here in the second half of this sermon is where he gives commands in the first half. Now he's going to give us the consequences of what happens when we fail to heed those commands that Jesus has just instructed. So this is kind of the negative half of the sermon. So in verse 42, the beginning of what we'll cover today, he says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me, he's still holding the child in his hands, right? He says, whoever causes one of these who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and were thrown into the sea. That's quite the verse, isn't it? Um, a couple things we need to define here. So when he says these little ones, obviously he's referencing the child that he's still holding in his hands. Um, but it's more about what, do the chi- what does the child represent? Um, there is uh, an ignorance in children and an innocence in that ignorance in that they don't know any better. Um, and so when he says... Or, Sorry, the, the little one, he's not just talking about children. I think it's not a stretch to say that we can expand this to, to anyone who has the, the vulnerability of a child. Um, right? And he says specifically, one of these little ones who are in me, implying that this is a child who is old enough to put their faith in Jesus, which typically is around five or six um, but they're not old enough to be able to discern, right, many of the other things beyond that. Um, and so I think we can, we can safely also lump into that group would be people who are spiritually vulnerable, like people who are not mentally capable to really discern a true teacher from a false teacher. And we could probably even expand that to new believers who have come to have an understanding in Jesus— um, but have not yet been grounded deep enough in the scriptures to, again, be able to fight off uh, false teachings. Um, so really, he's talking about anyone here who is spiritually vulnerable. And he says, so anyone who causes one of these little ones to sin. Now, the word sin here can be translated a couple different ways. Um, in there, There's really three, three words that this is translated into in English. The first one is sin. The second one is tempted, and the third one is fall away, implying right, some, when, when you lead someone away from the truth. So he's about to give the consequences to anyone who is going to tempt or who is going to lead astray people who are spiritually vulnerable, whether it's new believers or whether it's literally small children, that there are great consequences for the people that wish to harm those that when their eternity is at stake here. And what does he say? He says it would be, it would be better for him to have a great millstone hung around his neck and thrown into the sea. Um, so a millstone. Craig, if you want to go to the next slide here, I have a picture of a millstone here for you to look at. Um, In the ancient world, every town had a millstone, and the people in the town would come, and they would bring their grain, and they would put the grain along the bottom part, and then they'd attach a a large animal, usually like a a mule or an ox, and that would just kind of walk in circles, spinning that that upper wheel that would crush the grain into flour so they could make bread. And so when he's talking about a millstone, he's specifically referring to that top stone, that circular stone on top there. Um, And mills came in various sizes, um, but that top stone would have been probably an average of about 100 pounds. So he's saying, let's let's take one of those, tie it around somebody's neck, and throw it into the sea. That sounds like something out of like a mafia movie, right? We're going to give them the millstone necktie, Right, you ever heard like the was the the mob used to do like the concrete shoes where they'd pour concrete in there or they put their feet in concrete and then toss them off the docks. It's that same kind of thing. A um, couple things to note here: Jesus was not making up some like gruesome form of torture on the spot. That is an actual thing that the Romans did to people. 
that the Jews were aware of because they watched them do it. And by the way, you don't do something that graphic to somebody just as a punishment. It's meant as a warning to everyone else to deter them from doing the same thing. Do you want to die such a humiliating death like that person? Right? So that's what Jesus is warning of. He's also not literally instructing us to do this. Um, although I can certainly think of some circumstances where I think it would be fitting, um, right? The point is not that we actually drown people with millstones. What he's saying is that for anyone who would try to lead away some of these spiritually vulnerable people, what I have waiting for them in eternity is far worse than being drowned with that around your neck. Um, And so when we compare verse 42 to verse 37 that we read about last week, whoever receives a child in my name receives me, um, implied in that command in 37 is also the the assumption that we have, that those of us that know better, the rest of us, have the responsibility to protect those people that are vulnerable. And anyone who does the opposite, who does not receive one of these children, but instead deceives them and lies to them and pulls them away from the truth, these are the consequences that you have waiting for you. And we'll talk more about those consequences in just a moment. Um, But let's continue on and let's read verses 43 through 48. It says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better if you enter life with two or with or enter life lame than with two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. All right, to understand this, we need to talk about how do we read the Bible. Um, We are very proud of the fact that we believe that the Bible should be taken literally. What the Bible says, we need to do. However, it is possible to read the Bible too literally. Um, there was a church father named Origen, who was a very influential man who lived, I think, somewhere in like the three or four hundreds. Um, and the historical sources are a little sketchy on this, but legend has it that Origen actually emasculated himself so as to get rid of that temptation to sin. Now, there's a problem with that. If you chop off body parts, that doesn't remove the temptation. Uh, we could all be walking around like a bunch of pirates with eye patches and hooks for a hand and peg legs and still have the temptation to sin because the temptation to sin is not found in each individual body part. Sin comes from the heart. If you don't address the root cause of sin, which is our hard hearts, that we love sin more than we love God, it doesn't matter how many body parts you chop off, you're still going to be tempted to sin. Uh, right, so that's why we, we do not read the Bible as, like, with complete, we don't read it completely literal. We read the Bible literally as intended. It's a subtle but a very important difference. By adding that as intended part, that allows for us to take into consideration things like sarcasm, things like symbolic language. Right? Revelation talks about a red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Hey, to break it to you, there's not going to be an actual red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. But that dragon is a symbol. It represents something that is literally true. Um, And in this case, it allows us to interpret things like hyperbole. Hyperbole is in using exaggerated language in order to prove a point. This is something that Jesus was a master of. Jesus knew that to reach people, you don't only speak to their heads, but you also speak to their hearts. And so using dramatic language 
like this is one of the best ways to do it and something that he did frequently. He talked about um, like a camel going through the eye of a needle. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Take the log out of your own eye, right? These things are not literally possible, but they do teach a very important and a very real point. And so the point here is not that we are literally supposed to chop off our body parts, uh, but the, the real point that he's trying to make is that we should be willing to go to any lengths to get rid of sin. Um, when we talk about how Jesus uses exaggerated language, there is the tendency to go too far in the other direction, and then we begin to water down the point that Jesus is making. And really what he's trying to say here is that you need to go to, at any cost to remove the sin from your life. If you have people in your life that are trying to drag you back into the old ways, cut them out of your life. Find new friends. If you don't trust yourself with a smartphone that has a connection to the internet, take a hammer to it, smash it, and buy a flip phone. You'll survive. Right? Um, there, there's so many areas in our life that we need to be willing to make drastic sacrifices in order to get rid of the sin that is in our life. Because Jesus says that the consequences of failing to do so are much worse than whatever temporary sacrifice we may or may not be willing to make here. And he says, right, it is, uh, it is better to enter li or life with one hand than, be cri or than with two hands and go to hell. Now, I don't really like the word hell here that it uses, not because I'm offended by the word or anything like that, because the Bible talks about hell a lot. It actually talks about hell more than it does heaven. Um, the reason I don't like the word hell here is because it doesn't quite communicate what Jesus is actually saying. Hell can refer to actually two, like a couple different things. Um, in one sense, there's the Greek word Hades, and the Hebrew equivalent to that is Sheol. And Hades and Sheol are both communicate the same exact idea, that it's, uh, it's, it refers to the afterlife, or the grave, is another way that it could be interpreted. And it refers to a temporary holding place for people's souls after they die. Your body goes into the ground, and their souls go to Hades. Right? And so uh, for, for people that have rejected Jesus as their Savior, their souls are waiting in Hades. But that is a temporary holding place. Revelation 20 talks about something that it calls the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the eternal destination of everyone that is currently in Hades. It says specifically that it was made for Satan and his demons and for the false beast and prophet that are two, uh, the false prophet that are um, two figures mentioned in the book of Revelation. And then it says that Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire. So one's temporary, the other is eternal. Um, it's, think of it in terms of like if someone, if someone commits a felony, they go to a county jail, usually where they're held until their trial, and then they're sentenced to a state or federal prison where they will, get, stand, or they will spend the, the rest of the time that they are sent there. So that's kind of like the difference between Hades and the Lake of Fire. What Jesus says here is actually something different. He uses the word Gehenna which literally translates to the Valley of Hinnom. Hinnom is a real geographic location. It's located approximately three miles south of Jerusalem. And the Old Testament says that the Valley of Hinnom is the location where the Israelites strayed away from God and they started worshiping false gods and they actually sacrificed their own children to the Canaanite god of Molech by burning them alive. And so there are multiple times in the Old Testament where God pronounces judgment on this wicked, evil location because of the evils that were committed there. By the time of Jesus, the Valley of Hinnom had been turned into a burn pit where the residents of Jerusalem would take their garbage and sometimes even dead bodies and throw them into this massive burn pit. And it was somebody's job to make sure that there was always a fire lit there so it would burn through the, the garbage. 
And so when Jesus uses this, he's, he's referencing something that they are all very aware of, that they have seen with their own eyes. And a lot of people will take, take that knowledge and be like, see, hell isn't actually real. Jesus was just talking about this thing. No, hell is very real. And what Jesus is doing is saying that the, for the, the people that reject me, the people that choose their sin over a life of service towards me and towards other people, their eternal destination is worse than that place, right? The most evil, the most disgusting, putrid place that you can think of, what they have in store for them is even worse than that. These are the consequences for the people that choose to reject Jesus. Um, it says a lot of people think that right, that, uh, right, that God wouldn't actually send people to hell. Or some people teach that when, when unbelievers die, that their souls just cease to exist. Um, and that is a blatant contradiction to what Jesus actually teaches, right? That hell is eternal. And it is terrible and not a place that you want to be. There's not going to be any partying in hell. Verse 48, he says, Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That reference to worms is referring to the maggots that grow inside of a dead, rotted corpse. Right? That they just, it never stops and the fire never goes out. That's eternal language that is being used. Um, that brings me to another point. You may be wondering why I did not read verses 44 and 46. Um, I skipped over those because my Bible, the, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, does not include them. Um, the, the translation that Malia read from, I mean, if you have a King James, I believe those are in there, uh, or those, those, translations choose to include those verses. The reason being is that this is what's known as a textual variant. We talked a little bit about this before, but the short answer is that when we take the, the, the Greek copies of Mark that we have from a long time ago, some of those copies include those verses and some of them don't, right? There's no conspiracy here. People are like, oh, they're taking verses out of the Bible. Not necessarily. Really, the scholars have to ask themselves, okay, so we've got mixed evidence here. So did Mark actually write these verses or did he not? And let me tell you why it ultimately doesn't matter, especially in this case. Because verses 44 and 46 are the exact same thing as 48. It says, where, where, the, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So if you believe that Mark wrote those verses and that they should be included in there, it changes nothing of the meaning of the passage, except it just makes it a little bit more repetitive, which just puts more effect on the eternality of punishment that will be in hell. If we continue on to verses uh, 49 and 50, Jesus is going to kind of shift gears, and this is going to be his summary that's going to really wrap up this entire block of teaching uh, from last week and this week. He says, For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be open, or sorry, and be at peace with one another. Um, every time the Bible mentions salt, it's always in a good sense. Salt is delicious. It makes our food taste better. Um, also, up until about 100 years ago, when people started getting uh, refrigerators and freezers in their home, salt was the primary means of preserving food, meaning that the way that you keep those maggots out of your meat that were mentioned in verse 47, it, or verse 48, is by using salt, right? So we want salt. Salt's a good thing. Um, but it gets kind of confusing here in verse 29, or 49 when he says, everyone will be salted with fire. Um, we just talked about fire, right, that, that does not quench. Um, and so uh, my best explanation here is that it really seems that the, the fire in verse 48 and the fire in verse 49 are two different kinds of fire. The fire in verse 49 is an, etor an eternal torment uh, for those who have rejected Jesus. The fire in verse 49, it would be more of um, what scripture would call a 
or sorry, what scripture would call a refining fire. Think of a goldsmith that will use fire to heat up gold to let the, the impurities rise to the surface so they can remove it, right? And it's talking about the, the pain that we go through as Christians when we exercise the discipline to remove the sin from our lives. When we take what Jesus intended in the verses before about chopping off your hand and your foot and your eye, and we apply them in, in proper ways, we are removing impure things from our lives. And sometimes it hurts a little bit. It burns. Sometimes we bear the scars of those. And sometimes we, we don't always get it right, but we continue to push forward. And as we go through this, this refining process, we remove the sin from our lives, and each day we should be becoming more and more like Jesus. Um, this is uh, the equivalent to what we see in Hebrews 12, verse 11. He says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Right? When, we, when we look at the, the, the contrast between what Jesus said last week about humbling yourselves and serving, and then this week of the consequences for the people that choose not to do it, we're presented with a choice. Do we want to make ourselves less so that we can lift up Christ in our lives? Do we want to put the needs of other people before ourselves and become a servant to all and follow after Jesus? Or do we want to reject the teachings of Jesus and choose to continue on in our own sin, in our own power, for our own glory? And there are consequences depending on which one you choose. If you choose the first one, if you choose to lay down your life and take up your cross, the consequences are salvation, forgiveness, grace, and getting to see the face of God and glorify him forever. If we say, no, nah, that doesn't really sound good. I'm going to stick with doing things my way. I'm going to choose my sin. I don't want to go through the work to remove that. I like my sin. The consequences are eternal damnation, separation from God, and an unquenchable fire. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable, and that's kind of the point Jesus was really good at making people uncomfortable because that is the reality of our sin. If you think that the doctrine of hell sounds offensive, it's because you do not realize the depth of your sin nor the height of God's righteousness. And the more we realize just how righteous God is, the more we realize that any failure to yield to his will is a complete rejection of him, and that's what we deserve. And that's what all of us deserve, apart from God's grace. That for everyone that does not accept the good news of Jesus, that Jesus died on our behalf, that he became a substitute for the penalty of our sins, this is the destiny that we have waiting for us an unquenchable fire where the worm does not die and the fires do not go out. I certainly don't want that, nor do I want that for any of you, right? And that's why Jesus gave us a way out. That's why he just told us that the reason that he came was to die and to rise again so that we can be forgiven of our sins and we can have an opportunity to repent from those and to live a life of service to God. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for... Uh, not only the, the good news of Jesus, um, but also the warning that you have given us. And it can be, so many people want to look at it and say, well, that's, that's hateful, but that's the result of what, when we hate you. I pray that you would just help us to trust you, that you would help us to humble ourselves before you have to do it for us. Um, that you would just refine our lives, that you would expose the sin that we still hold on to in our hearts and uh, that we can become more like your son. And we thank you for that gift of Jesus. We thank you for the security that we have in him and that for those of us that have put our faith in Jesus, that that's not, hell is not something that we need to fear because that's not an option for us anymore. Um, but help us to walk in a way that will honor and glorify you.
We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.